Howdy, everyone, and welcome to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma, the president of American Moment, and I'm joined by Nick Solheim, the COO of American Moment. And welcome back to our podcast. We're really excited for the episode that we have for y'all today. Once again, we've been so honored by all the support we've had as we've, you know, launched this organization and and continued, uh, you know, steaming ahead with with everything that we're building here. Once again, if you want to find out more about what we have cooking, go to AmericanMoment.org. Um, I don't know, Nick, how have you been feeling as we get this this project underway? Man, it has been such a a good time like the 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 outpouring of support has been far beyond what i expected i mean between the fellowship applications to the people you know which by the way we've gotten like a lot of like a lot more than i thought it's going to be very difficult to still to apply weed. though still apply though yes, <laughs> definitely apply um still weeding through all those and then and then you know the people who have been there have been a lot of people who have been organically tweeting our podcasts like oh my goodness you know listen to this podcast it's great, um, we've had a great time you know since launch a couple of weeks ago uh, you know was very glad to spend some time uh, recording this podcast with Michael Meadowcroft today um, you know this was the first time this is episode four first time I've been able to fitness and diet post, you know, <laughs> since we've started this podcast. So very excited for you all to hear about um, the slunking of raw eggs and uh, just fitness posting in general. Nick has the soul of a mommy Instagram blogger, really, <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, I, I, I know Nick and his girlfriend both very well. And Nick tends to uh, post a lot more on Instagram than she does. But yeah, we had this a fan. true. This is true. (laughs) I used to be fat though. So I'm like, I'm like getting my like high school need for attention out of the way now. That's right. That's right. Um, You know, once you have some uh, family and kids, you're going to start baby posting down the line and and that's (laughs) going to be great. Um, But yeah, we had a fantastic time with our friend Micah Metacroft on today's episode. Micah is the managing editor at the American Conservative. He just started there recently and we were so excited to see him uh, join there because we love what the American Conservative does. It's one of the greatest magazines uh, out there in America today. Uh, They frame it as as a middle brow magazine. And so it's very much that. It's very accessible. I highly recommend you check it out. But before joining the American Conservative, he served as the White House liaison at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And, uh, you know, he was one of the, the people that were brought in in that last year of the Trump administration to finally clean house and start implementing the priorities that the American people elected the president in order to implement. Mike has also written at all sorts of other outlets, uh, including the Wall Street Journal, First Things, American Compass, American Affairs. Uh, and I'm sure several other publications. He also has a, an MA in social science from the University of Chicago. He is an academic. Uh, please don't throw tomatoes as your, at your phone as you hear that, but um, uh, we, we like him regardless. You know, the episode was really great today in particular because, you know, when talking about the Trump administration, I have not heard anyone talk about, you know, how the Trump administration work to, you know, support environmentalism. Like most people in the mainstream media hear Trump and they're like, oh, he hates the environment and he hates America, you know, whatever. Um, But, you know, as you'll learn through this episode that we listened to today, the Trump administration, you know, cared a lot about how people interacted with the environment around them. Um, And by the way, like why most Americans should care about the environment. So, very encouraging episode, um, and I'm really excited to, to hear your guys' reaction to this. Absolutely. So we'll go now to Mike Metacroft. Welcome to the podcast, Micah. Thanks for having me. It's good to be here. You just started as the managing editor at the American Conservative, and some of our listeners, you know, they're Zoomers, they're functionally illiterate. Can you explain just a little bit about what the American Conservative is and uh, why you're excited to be there? Presuming you are. <laughs> I'm very excited to be there. It's actually my second stint at the American Conservative. I was a lowly uh, editorial assistant at one point. That's code for coffee boy. That's code for intern. <laughs> yes. And uh, so the American Conservative was founded in the aftermath of the Afghanistan invasion and the lead up to the war in Iraq as a explicit counterweight to the neocons. It's a paleocon publication started by Pat Buchanan, Scott McConnell, and Tacky, Tacky, 
you know, it's got a Greek long Greek name. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's a great time to be back in particular because we are re-entering essentially a political season very much like the one in which it was founded, that there's a uh, preoccupation with the threat of terrorism. This time it's domestic and a high likelihood of an unchecked expansion of the security state. And so our responsibility attack is to remind people that the local is worth protecting and that power centralized in Washington is something worth resisting and that America should stay home and take care of itself. Yeah, I got to say, you know, the American conservative for the Zoomer followers we have that do read um, was very important in actually like my political idea making so for me like the red pilling journey began on twitter like it did for the rest of us men you know with uh with a lot of memes wojack memes you know all the kinds of memes about politics and i would you know call home talk to people talk to friends and and they'd be like why do you believe this and i would say i don't know like, <laughs> memes on twitter told me to believe it but i don't know why um and, you know, a lot of the people that I followed who were who were sharing these memes were also sharing pieces from the American conservative. And so, you know, I kind of start reading and then I subscribe and then I start getting, you know, this magazine in my inbox uh, every two months and 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 reading it. It's and, actually and, a mailbox. I know, you know, that's confusing and pre your guys's technology, but yeah, the magazine okay. goes to a <laughs> mailbox. Whatever, whatever. <laughs> Um, and it, it was actually very formative in me being able to explain like why I believe the things that I believed, you know, there, there are some publications out there that are very like, very, uh, you know, kind of up in your brain, very complicated, very hard to read. Um, and the American conservative kind of provided an on-ramp for me to be able to understand, um, you know, a lot of the policies that I was advocating for, uh, in an un educated manner on Twitter. So I would recommend that everybody uh, read The American Conservative. Micah, you said that you you had done, this is your second stint at The American Conservative. Why don't you walk our listeners through sort of how you ended up as managing editor? What did you do in the intervening years? Uh, I know you 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 went back to, to academia. Ooh, terrible. Yes. Uh, wh why don't you explain how you kind of got here? Sure. So I am a graduate of Hillsdale College in Michigan. Lots of people from Hillsdale end up in DC. I was one of them. I came out here to pursue uh, journalism, broadly speaking, but obviously by defaulting to DC, it was going to be political journalism. And I bounced around a bit, including my stint at the American Conservative, and then ended up at the Washington Free Beacon for a long time, which were, they were great employers um, and really good people and happy to have worked there. Uh, eventually, I realized that, well, the academy was sort of whispering in my ear, as it does for many people in similar career trajectories here in DC, and I thought I'd... Uh, there's a certain comfort that comes from having being steadily employed. And there was this realization, it's now or never. If I don't go back now, I will become too comfortable and will not want to become the rice and beans child of the ivory tower. And so I made my applications and was very fortunate to get into an interesting one-year program at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's their MA program in social sciences. I focused on political theory. So I spent a year at in the uh, neo-Gothic beauty of University of Chicago. They ripped off some Oxford buildings, like whole cloth. Well, it's not whole cloth, whole stone. Um, and Cambridge buildings. They just kind of, they're like, we like that. We're rebuilding it here. In the middle of a war zone. What do you, oh, <laughs> 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 yes, <laughs> Southern Chicago. Yes, uh, the South Side. Um, yeah, unfortunately, no, you definitely get those emails from security. Uh, but that was a great experience. I really enjoyed my time there, but I kind of realized it was, uh, the Academy was not for me, or at least not right now. And so I came back out to DC and joined the administration for the, the final months. Uh, I was the White House liaison at EPA and also assisted, assisted in speech writing there. And that was a really great experience. And then here I am at the American Conservative as managing editor, doing a lot of things that I've done before, but very much excited about the future. Um, we're going to be the premier middle brow publication of the right. And I think you're going to succeed. You know, I think you're the first administration official or former uh, that we've had on the podcast, and we plan on having a lot more. Uh, what was that experience like? Just walk our, our our listeners through what it was like to be part of the Trump administration, especially during what was obviously a a tumultuous time in those final months. Uh, what what were the takeaways? Well, I think first off, when people say oh, it was the honor of my life, um, a lot of times they mean it, and it really is an amazing experience to realize that you are allowed to be part of trying to implement the 
uh, people's will and the vision of the president in the executive branch of the federal government. But the biggest takeaway in the Trump administration was that it takes swamp creatures to drain the swamp. Um, even four years in. Do you identify as a swamp creature? I'm becoming one, unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately. I would say um, I think that we are too. Like we... We literally I I started resent. a podcast. Yeah. I, I resent this. You're, I've you, only been here like four months. I'm sorry. <laughs> you, you're, you're operators. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, so yes, that is the largest takeaway is simply that the administrative state, everything you've heard is true. It's as bad as you feared. The bureaucracy is as sclerotic. Uh, it's understandably because they have to at least have the pretense of doing politics without final ends is totally process oriented. And so you have generations and generations of bureaucrats creating processes and creating a culture that says uh, the main objective is to essentially cover your butt. It's, it's turf protection. It's stick to the book. Make sure that when the hot potato lands, it's not on you. And that means everything is slow. Everything is as inefficient as possible. And that the levers of power are totally inscrutable in a lot of ways. Um, and most things just, they come into being and then they can't, but can't be put back in the box. I mean, it's like, you know, it's the Pandora story over and over and over again, but with stupid, stupid rules and random, you know, meeting protocols. So you go in as a political appointee and your responsibility is to care about product. And you say, you know, here are the policy objectives we have. What can we do? And you have your political appointed lawyers, and they're very important. And my estimation of lawyers went up in my time in government. Uh, and they say, okay, here are the wiggle, here's the wiggle room we're working with. Here are our workarounds. Let's try this. But then you have the permanent lawyers and just the non lawyer bureaucrats who are used to things going a certain way and want you to stick to the book. And they have lots of ways to make sure that you mostly do. And then even when you do finally, I mean, I had some really great. So I, the White House liaison position is a is actually largely an HR one. You know, it's it's coordinating hiring decisions and promotion decisions between the chief of staff and the the administrator's office and the White House. And so I've heard it described as a commissar. Is that accurate? <laughs> <laughs> there are in certain contexts, if you're in a you know recalcitrant administration or agency department, then yes, I suppose you are a political commissar. But generally speaking, you're the go between you're communicating and you're coordinating things and actually uh, moving a lot of the paperwork. So this is my one and only experience in HR, I hope only I should say. Um, but the staff I worked the professional HR people that I worked with, they were actually really wonderful, and very professional, timely people. Uh, they were very clear about what was possible. And also, if it was possible in the sense of normal, and if it was possible in the sense of you can bend our arms and we'll do it eventually, but we'll, you know, file a protest or something like that. So all those things exist, but that, that means though, that that's like the good side, that's the good version of it. And then extrapolate that to the whole federal government. And, uh, that's maybe the biggest conclusion was just that everything that I had worried about the unaccountable executive branch, getting away from both the presidency and from Congress was absolutely true. To a large degree, it's Congress's fault because they don't exercise the power of the purse. They don't um, write bills in sufficient detail, despite the length, right? You you know, you look at the average piece of legislation, it's enormous. No one has actually read it. But they're not writing any of the details that matter, the implementation details that matter into it, or even limiting implementation standards. So what ends up happening is they create some sort of vaguely you know, the Clean Air Act is a classic example. There shall be clean air. Figure it out. <laughs> well, there shall be clean air and there shall be the cleanest air. And so therefore, uh, you're in empowering parts of the EPA or the Department of Energy and so on and so forth to continuously ratchet down despite massive gains that we have in fact made. And this is funny because in certain environments, I end up sounding like the DREG guy. But generally speaking, by conservative standards, I'm very much not. And I'm very much one who sees the value in regulatory action. It's just very true that by focusing on, um, by allowing and by empowering administrators and agency officials and be un specifically the unelected ones to set these standards, but then also to demand that they be met in certain ways. And, and there's a restriction and flattening 
of the options available to the rest of American Republicanism in the sense of your state government has to come up with implementation plans that have to be approved here and, uh, you know, approved over there and, and brought into compliance there. And so what might work well in Texas may not work well in North Dakota, but it's very difficult to make sure that that's respected. And, and so there's this, there's these tensions and that, that was a big takeaway is just like our federal system is in some sense, if we are serious about the importance of maintaining local political, not sovereignty in the end, right? We fought a civil war over, over the end sovereignty, but uh, a certain degree of self-determination and self-governance, then that's in tension with the idea of national regulations. And so that's the, the prudential judgment that has to be constantly made is what what are we trying to preserve uh, nationally here? And then what are we also trying to preserve locally? And how do we make sure that those aren't stepping on each other? You came from Hillsdale. You probably heard a lot in your undergraduate degree about, uh, you know, the administrative state, you know, your time at the Free Beacon and so on. It, it's sort of, you know, part of the conservative education to learn about the ills of the administrative state. It sounds like you didn't realize just how bad it would be when you went to the administration. Is there anything else like that, that that you changed your mind on when it came to your approach to government, your approach to the executive branch, your approach to, uh, I guess, your approach to human nature based on your experience at EPA? Well, I think I had a higher view of <laughs> this is sort of a pessimistic thing to say, considering what you guys are starting and, and what I plan to continue to do. But I'd, I'd had, a, I think, higher, a greater optimism about the potential for political solutions to a lot of national problems and had supposed that four years was going to be enough time to get a handle on things. And then you could have a second term and you'd finally know how the levers worked and stuff could really get done. And to a certain degree, that was true. The last year of the administration was finally getting a lot together, but it was a lot of too little too late, unfortunately. And so that was discouraging, was this realization that even given four more years, yes, it would be a lot better than the alternative. However, I'm not sure actually how effective it would end up being and that the, the needs are really, really dramatic. Um, and they're gonna take a kind of concerted effort on the part of a stupendously gifted and charismatic executive and members of Congress who are also stupendously gifted and charismatic. And unfortunately, we're working with a very thin bench in general. And that's not just true within the bureaucracy. That's true on top, right? We've got everyone wants to be in charge, but most of them shouldn't be team captain. And then their support staff, which is what you guys are obviously trying to, to fix there. It's thin pickings there too. And so that is kind of the biggest takeaway is that the drop off from say the immediate, the immediate office of an administrator who is part of the outer cabinet is incredibly administrator. Wheeler was an incredibly competent man. Uh, very impressive. I really, really enjoyed working for him and his immediate staff also incredibly competent, very enjoyable to work with, but the drop off is rather precipitous and you start realizing, oh, we have, it is the bench is thin. And so one advantage, of course, is that, you know, every administration produces a new crop of people who have federal experience and are in theory, the kinds of swamp creatures who might understand how to operate the levers of power. And with the Trump administration, you had different people than usual doing that. And so that that's interesting. We, we have a, a wider, you know, perhaps we've expanded the bench, but also four years out of power is four years time to get really comfortable, right? And it's hard to be confident that were we lucky enough, if we're lucky enough to win in 2024, are we going to be able to staff up with people who are hungry and ready to do something different? Or are we going to staff up with people who've gotten comfortable and complacent here? And DC is a very comfortable town. COVID has made it less comfortable. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm sorry for you guys. You guys have arrived, you know, not during its heyday, but um, yeah, it's, it's definitely pushed me. I've always had localist leanings and in some sense, that's the big tension in my personal political life is that I genuinely think that most people in my position should go home now and should be building at home now. But I feel personally called to be here trying to create space for people to go home. 
so that's, you know, it's tricky though. And, and I don't know if I'm deluding myself. I probably am. There's like, you know, probably some percentage degree that it's just like, this is self-deception. Just go, you'll be happier if you go do that. But you know, Hey, that's the classic DZ conundrum. So I want to ask you a question on that, like sure. kind of personal political, um, thing. Uh, you know, you're from the Pacific Northwest, yep. right? Um, and, uh, are you literally from Portland, Oregon? I was born in Portland, grew up right outside it, across the Columbia River in Vancouver, Washington, which is the original Vancouver. So Vancouver, British Columbia, Canadian Vancouver. We do not recognize no, the pretenders to the he's, north. He's the second Portland, former Portland resident that we've had in the podcast. We had, you know, Marshall Kozlov, who is also from yes. Portland. Yes. Um, we had him on on the pod for our first episode. Um, Phil but, Jeffrey at Newsweek, also from Portland. There's a, a bunch of random conservative writer guys floating around. I guess so far have been two New Yorkers, two Texans, and two Oregonians. Perfect. Very nice. Um, but no, the, the the question that I want to ask you is, um, and, and it's one that I you know am, am very interested in as well, is honestly like you, you kind of have this movement on the right where people are like, oh, you know, environmentalism like that's for libs like caring about the environment is for the other side um you know you have this piece out in the american conservative today which is featured on am canon called look back for the future of conservative environmentalism um could you just walk us through like conservative environmentalism and why you know your your average everyday conservative you know in middle america but also the people who want to come and work out here why should they care about the environment? I mean, the essential point that I'm trying to make is that we as, you know, body and soul, as animal, spiritual animals, our environment shapes us and we shape that environment in turn. And so what we're doing to the environment is being done by us to us. And, you know, we could take some steps back and talk about the people who have inspired me. I mean, to a certain degree, this is very much out of, I mean, C.S. Lewis was probably the first kind of uh, person I thought of as like an intellectual inspiration as a kid. And he has a line in The Abolition of Man that's essentially that the like gains in, you know, gains in scientific power have just been the gains of some human beings over other human beings. And the same is true of our conquest of nature that over the course of 200 years of industrial revolution, by the time of the 1960s, you really do have, well, A, you have the erasure of the frontier. So our boy Teddy is in his lifetime. For listeners, we have a bust of Teddy Roosevelt on the desk here. We are, we're big respecters of, of one Teddy Roosevelt here. Which actually, to clarify, we probably shouldn't call him if we're big respecters. We shouldn't call him Teddy Roosevelt. So he was called TD by his family. And then the adoption, the widespread adoption of Teddy as a nickname for him, he thought was infantilizing. And he preferred to just be TR or Theodore. So... Anyway, Theodore it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I also have a bust um, of his head that Rob gave me for my birthday. Very kind um, that I keep on my desk at all times. So, Always watching. So, yeah. so T.R. Theodore Roosevelt in his lifetime saw the shrinking of the frontiers. So he spent a lot of time on the Dakotas as both a dude playing cowboy and then a real cowboy uh, and bison hunting, which is very cool. And we should all look forward to a future in which we can bison hunt. Uh, return the herds. But he actually, since, he, since he went there, we did yeah. want to ask. We did want to talk about that. <laughs> Explain the bison thing. Well, well first, let me. <laughs> you know, let, we'll, we'll, we'll get, get back, back to it. it. Um, and but even in his lifetime, in his times as an outdoorsman, that he saw that the herds were going west. So were the birds. Like the badlands themselves were sort of disappearing. So his Boone and Crockett Club and himself as president and he, conservation was a huge part of his life and, and, and along with trust busting and other things, a big part of his political mission. So there's that first sort of step in what I think of as the conservative environmental genealogy. And the second one is this idea of ecology, which is just the recognition that we exist in a chain of life in much the same way. And this is one of the interesting things is people like to complain about modernity being dis you know, disenchanted. But if we take seriously our place in the chain of life, especially if you're a Christian, recognizing this as a created order, that's just as beautiful and rich and complex as the chain of being of the medieval mental model. Um, 
and, and they're very interrelated, right? The chain of being just includes angels, which we can do that too. Come on, it's cool. <laughs> uh, and so ecology says that we are ourselves a part of this chain and that it's all interrelated, that, you know, that there's sort of the old classic cliche, like the butterfly effect, you know, does a butterfly in Texas cause a hurricane in Japan? I don't know, probably not. But uh, there, the essential feature there is that everything affects everything else. And it's all one big created order. There's, you know, the many parts in the one whole. And so that allows human beings to have the consciousness of our own place in shaping, again, the external environment, the lived environment, the broader environment, the global whole, and ourselves in that process, because then suddenly we're, we're in it. And so environmentalism was the shift from the frontier to the man-made environment, to the, sh to the recogn the recognition that we were shaping both parts of the natural order and also that cities themselves are environments, that we live in what is fortunately a very beautiful city mostly, except for I was, you know, I'm not going to get over it, just shocked by it, the fencing around the Capitol complex. Um, Occupied Baghdad on the Potomac. Yeah, the green zone. <laughs> yeah, it is It is actually evil. That is that is very interesting. You know, I have a lot of uh, friends who are Democrats that live on Capitol Hill and, and longtime residents, like 10, 15, 20 years. And this is like insert conservative slash liberals handshake meme. Like everyone is very perturbed by the ongoing fencing around the Capitol. Like our... You know, our imperial city is beautiful. And the fact that like people can't see it is, is you know, disappointing. Right. And normally to walk across the Capitol complex, no matter how cynical you are or how long you've been here, if it's a beautiful day and the clouds part, the sun comes through, you are, your soul is elevated. You look up and you can't but feel that you are called to a higher purpose and that you are here for a mission. No wonder every intern that's here wants to take those Capitol Hill photos. <laughs> <laughs> and so... That's the kind of, you know, spiritual and physical, because those aren't, you know, separable, uh, the effects of our lived environments, right? High ceilings versus low ceilings. There's lots, you can get as small about it as you want to be. Uh, actually, there's nothing small about the importance of high ceilings, but uh, <laughs> the- This is about to become a thing about feng shui or something. Yeah. Can, we, can we aesthetics um, check, please? <laughs> it's pretty good. It's a mix. You know, some of these statues are- Cooler than others. That's there's, there's my uh, my take here, uh, but the bourbon's good. Thank you. Um, so the point I primarily wanted to make is that we are conserving a type. Of, so conservatives generally think of themselves as as maintaining the possibility of a traditional mode of human life, and therefore the capacity for human beings to become most fully themselves. And what I think TR illustrates is that he was most fully himself when he was adventuring and specifically when he was in the beauty of the Badlands and the Dakotas. And so that capacity for flourishing for the full spectrum of human types to emerge requires the full spectrum of environments to exist. And the health of those of human types also in, you know, entails the health of their environment. And so one of the points I wanted to leave people with from a kind of what now standpoint is I'm not a tech optimist in the sense of that that's normally used um, in the sense that will Bitcoin redeem our spirits? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Uh, but I'm, I mean, Bitcoin's interesting. Um, but I do you hold a doge <laughs> diamond hands, man. Um, <laughs> The the point I want to leave people, so one of the points I want to leave people with is that the to like tech needs to be a complement, and our use of technology, our use of industry, our use of the markets, all of these things are supposed to be complements to the uh, full flourishing of the human being. And so when the left says we're going to restrict things in this way. We're going to set these really uh, you know, tight green policies, demand certain kinds of diversifications of energy sources, and so on and so forth. They're ignoring a bunch of the limits of existing technology to do that. So for example, I got uh, someone tweeted at me today in response to the piece saying, well, why didn't you talk about how solar panels are getting cheaper, man? 
you said tech has stalled out. This is kind of the classic Peter Thiel thesis. You said tech has stalled out since the 70s, but solar panels are cheaper. And that may be true. And we can have a conversation about, you know, government subsidies of that. Like, is that, was that a good thing? Was that a bad thing? Wasted money, good money. But the other issue is that solar panels are still incredibly energy inefficient to produce. And they're made- They're environmental nimbyism. Like <laughs> the, the rare earth minerals that are required right. in order to create a solar panel. <laughs> it just moves it somewhere else yeah. where white liberals can't see it. That's all that. <laughs> a, a, a photovoltaic cell, uh, to use the, you know, the- Department of Energy term for it is a takes a bunch of rare mineral, rare earth minerals. B can't be, I mean, a B won't last forever, right? They have a limited lifespan, and then C therefore Which is has we're to gonna be... come up on soon. Like the the solar panel boom during the Obama administration is about to crescendo to the expiration date right. of a lot of those exactly. solar panels, and, and we don't really have a plan, <laughs> right? What's going to end up happening is we're going to have solar panels stacked in because they can't go because of the metal content there most of them can't go into most landfills and so you're going to have classic waste management problem and so they're going to end up in like warehouses or something just rotting on top of each other and who knows what kind of leakages will happen but i mean i don't want to overstate the leakage question i just mean to say they're not themselves efficient products like they aren't recyclable and again this is you know a kind of not a throwaway comment but an aside in my piece is that we don't take seriously enough the degree to which the question of environmental pollution happens on both ends of the production process. So obviously the classic question or consideration is like, is the factory throwing stuff into the river or is are the smokestacks pumping things into the air? But when you move the factory and the smokestacks to China and we're just consuming all the products of said factory and smokestacks, A, there's the question of like, you know, if we're going to take seriously the idea of a global environment, did we help? at all in doing that, but we can pretend at least that we're less pollutant. But B, our consuming of all those junk products produces now a waste stream. So yes, we we, we offset the production side, but now we have all of these things that we're going to throw away. Yeah. And, and, and in I think, many cases to ship back to China, right? And, like most of our recycling in the United States which goes they don't, back. Which they don't take anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'm sorry, your, your plastic bottles aren't going anywhere except into a landfill um, or into storage containers or something. Um. Well, so I saw this in my apartment complex a couple of weeks ago. I hate to bring up anecdotes. Like I really do, but I was driving behind my, um, you know, like garbage truck that picks up all the garbage and stuff from my building. And they dumped the, the like garbage and the recycling into the same truck and mashed it all together. And I was like, Dang, I'm very sad. <laughs> <laughs> like this hurts, you know? Yeah. I mean, well, there are, so there are all of these, um, that was, so one of the things I got to participate in at EPA was their annual recycling conference or summit. I think the summit was the word they were going with. And there were a number of organizations and startups and things that were specifically highlighting their ability to improve recycling, you know, sorting recycling sorting because it is it's intensive and most people don't want to really do it and so on and so forth but yes again that's simply taking uh, it's unfortunately it's one step early and you don't know after you've sorted it where it ends up it may very well all get dumped in the same bucket and if china isn't going to take it then who is and so we really i mean i think i think it's pope francis who said who has described the west the modern west as a throwaway culture and that is what we have to be rejecting that the sustainable environment, conservative environmentalism is not built on tech optimism because the right has engaged in this too. We have treated environmentalism. We have treated the stewardship of our country as a luxury good that if we make enough money through financialization and offshoring, then somehow we're going to be able to buy our way out of the problem that we're digging ourselves into or that we have dug ourselves into. And, and this is very much the like, Others like, if, you know, to, to use the midwit meme format, like we should be conservative environmentalists is something that like the squishiest moderates support and, you know, our side of the you know movement supports as well. But those squishy moderates tend to do it in like hockey stick go up, you know, GDP is going to go up and we're going to be able to fix the environment that and way. Then, and then everyone in the middle is like, oh, caring for the environment, that's socialism, you know? <laughs> well, and one of the important concessions, it's not even a concession, it's a celebra It's an opportunity for celebration that you have to make in these conversations to, to have a constructive one, is we have made a lot of progress. Things were really bad in the 60s. 
EPA was founded in 1970, there has been an insane amount of progress made. The country is cleaner than it has been in living memory. And that is something worth celebrating, but it's also worth talking about what was low hanging fruit and and what is, you know, what rate of cleaning is sustainable? Like at a certain point, if things were really dirty, of course it's got of course it got better. Mm -hmm. And then now what do we do when it's at a place that's pretty good? And, and, and what counts as pretty good, right? These are the conversations we actually need to be having is, is this is clean enough and we want to keep that there and then we'll see what happens or that is clean enough. And the other thing is the emissions focus of the green movement preoccupation with global warming and climate change is distracting from much more important and also easier to deal with, like lower hanging fruit. Uh, environmental pollutants in just the lived environment of human beings, right? The inner cities are dirty places. Mm -hmm. We still have lead pipe problems everywhere. We have lead paint problems all over. Like there are these obvious residual pollutant, you know, the Superfund system, if you're not familiar with that, those are like spots that were incredibly polluted through industrial malfeasance or just neglect at various points in the 20th century and, and sometimes even getting close to the 19th century. And they're, they've been designated as, as super fun spots, or there's also the Brownsfields program, which are these shovels first, lawyers second issues, right? They, there is funding designated by Congress to be ex, you know used by EPA and other organizations to clean these places up. And then they'll go hunt down you know, the company that was maybe responsible for it or the owner of the land and stuff like that and say, hey, you, the, you owe the American tax people, taxpayers some amount of money. But like that kind of stuff, that's the stuff that affects real people in a much more tangible way than now. I mean, I don't want to pretend that there weren't smog problems or there haven't been smog problems or anything like that, right? Like London had their smog issue in the late 50s or early 60s that killed hundreds of people um, just because of uh, you know, there was like a settling in of the, there wasn't a wind and it just sat on the city and suffocated people. But that's not the reality we're living with now. And so it's time to focus on, you know, we've, we've, we did the low hanging air fruit and we, we've done a lot of like work on, on water purity. And now it's time to focus on the land and to go and find those communities that are most vulnerable. That's often like African-Americans is often native Americans too. And uh, like the reservations haven't always been treated very well. And to say like, this is our you know responsibility is to, is to give everybody the best neighborhood they can have mm. from an environmental standpoint. And to preserve the cleanness of, of places like, you know, the Shastas or, or uh, you know, yeah, just I mean, the California mountain ranges are beautiful and yeah. the Pacific Northwest. An example that was recently in the news was, you know, Tucker Carlson and Nick Ayers and a couple other people. Uh, I think the, the folks at Bass Pro Shops made a lot of uh, noise in order to prevent um, the um, uh, pebble mine from coming into existence, mm -hmm. which was basically this Alaska uh, fishing and wild rice life reserve that was going to become a copper mine, uh, and and it would have destroyed the fishing environment there. It would have had all sorts of downstream ecological and environmental consequences. And because of a lot of right leaning people speaking up and and lobbying against it, and this was called socialism at the time, that was present prevented from happening. And I think that was a fundamentally good thing. And unfortunately, a lot of the supposed conservative environmental groups were actually utterly silent on it because again, they have this preoccupation on the issue of climate change and you know fiddling around the edges with carbon taxes when there's a lot more low hanging fruit when it comes to the ways that people actually live their lives that can be attacked first. And I mean like part of that like was cronyism like to a certain extent like there were you know people in the administration who really liked fishing there and I just like I wish there were more places like that in the United States you know where like obviously it was good that you know, um, people were advocating for protecting the environment and, and you know, Alaska in particular. Um, I've done a lot of work, you know, in the Arctic and on the Arctic region. And and I think preserving, you know, beautiful parts of the United States is, is important. And I just wish we would do more of it. So I do want to ask you like a specific question. Um, Late on. You know, so talking about some, some of this stuff with, with Teddy and going back to kind of this philosophical, like, you know, he goes out to the Badlands to find himself. Um, you know, for people who don't know and haven't read a lot of uh, history about Roosevelt, um, he went out to 
uh, you know, North Dakota to the Dakotas um, after his first wife died and, and, you know, went to kind of like find yourself, I guess is like the 21st century like term for it, but went to go spend some time out there and, and ran a, uh, it was a cattle ranch. He had his own cattle ranch, yeah. 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 Um, So, and, and, you know, he kind of comes back from the Dakotas as the Theodore Roosevelt, you know, TR that, that we know today. Um, so what I want to ask you is, you know, a lot of Americans could probably find themselves, you know, in this environment if they, you know, spent more time in our national parks and that sort of thing. But but what I want to ask you is, what can your your average listener of this podcast be doing to preserve the environment for their children, for their future generations? And, and how can they do it in a conservative way that doesn't kind of kowtow towards, you know, modern liberalism, um, you know, talking about like solar panels that really just kind of push the problem to another region. Um, what can we be doing to conserve the environment in a conservative way? Well, I think the first thing to say is that the strategy or the tendency to put conservation and environmentalism on individual consumer choices is part of the problem mm. because you and I are not the primary polluters. And that is not to say that the oligarchs of this country are in their personal consumptive capacities also the primary polluters, though a private jet is not exactly an efficient use of anybody's fuel. Mm -hmm. uh, John Kerry. <laughs> <laughs> but that is to say that it's much more important to hold corporate power accountable and to take seriously, you know, where, where that money is being spent and on what, I mean, even think about, think about the, I mean, you'd mentioned Bitcoin earlier, but like Bitcoin mining is incredibly electricity intensive. Uh, it's not a zero emissions proposition. Uh, there, you know, it, it is mining, right? It's it, mining has always been energy intensive and so is Bitcoin. And that's not to say it's bad, but it's just, as, you know, it is to say that there's a cost to all of this and, but the costs matter at scale. And so you have to look at the places where the scale is happening. I mean, this is maybe too tack of an answer for you, but like, I think a big part of it is maybe if we weren't waging wars of choice all over the world, uh, we could focus on rebuilding and cleaning the country and both monetarily and also just like energy out, out, outlay. Uh, there's a huge, you know, potential there. Potent um, but as far as, you know, for what the average listener can do, I think the biggest thing is just live a sustain like a live a life that's a life of limits freedom within limits right it's it's taking walks it's recognizing it's it's going it's getting out there and just learning to appreciate nature again to notice it that's the biggest thing is you have to learn to see and you have to learn to listen and hear the birds and also to recognize that your food where your food comes from matters that um we have in pursuit of I mean, it's an, it's a noble pursuit, the relief of man's estate, right? The desire to, uh, make sure that no one has to starve, but we got, we got past that point a while ago. And now we're just at this weird world of unsustainable consumption habits. And so I think the easiest thing you can do as an individual consumer is just to lean on the local and build where you are and learn to love the place you are. And whether that's planting a garden and trying to eat as much of that garden as you can, or whether that's buying from a local co-op, um, getting a share in a cow, things like that. I mean, it's hard to justify uh, contemporary, like normal standards for pig, pig harvesting, uh, in particular, um, beef, more variable, uh, eggs. I'm a big fan of eggs. Um, you should get the best eggs you can afford. Sometimes I cheat and I feel bad about it. You got to get the best eggs you can afford. So um, where, do you get, where do you get your eggs from? We were talking a little bit before the show about your uh, raw egg slonking habit. So can you just give us, I know we don't have a lot of time, but 30 seconds about why you slonk raw eggs and where you get your eggs from. Also, what does slonking mean for our <laughs> uh, perhaps <laughs> older listeners? If you've seen the original Rocky Balboa uh, film, then you've seen... Rocky slonking eggs when he wakes up for his workout. So it's just shooting some eggs back raw. Uh, it's a great way. I mean, it's a classic way to get up, you know, to up your calorie intake very easily, right? 
you've suddenly swallowed 60 calories without really noticing it. And an egg is a much better 60 calories than your Pepsi or Coca-Cola or whatever. Uh, the other kind of health benefits, I mean, the really commonly cited one is that the cholesterol and fats of a raw egg or specifically the raw egg yolk are incredibly um, bioavailable building blocks for your body's hormone production um, because those are based on like lipids and other things. And then also there's a number of nutrients and, and essentially like there's all sorts of things going on in an egg because an egg is supposed to produce a chicken, right? It's like, like it's, it's all the potential for a whole new living being. Um, and so there's all things, a bunch of things in going on in an egg that we just don't understand. Uh, the yolk is the big part. Um, so some people I know who are into the idea of eggs as a health food will still cook their whites, but like separate out the yolks and shoot the yolks. That's a little more work than I'm willing to do. I'm a min maxer in a lot of things I like, um, low effort, but high reward. Uh, so yeah. And then as far as where I get my eggs, I just get the best eggs at my local Trader Joe's because there aren't a lot of great farmers markets actually in Northern Virginia, which is a shame because Northern Virginia is not that far from genuine agricultural country, but the farmers markets don't make it in. Do you guys well. have a yes organic market in Northern Virginia? Not in my neighborhood, but I'm familiar with yes. Okay, so I live in I live in Woodley Park. That's where I get my eggs. Um, I consume about six eggs a day. So as do I. Yeah. So I uh, brother. I, I cook mine most of the time, but I am an occasional slonker of raw eggs when well, I how don't do you have take time. your eggs when you when you cook them. So I was originally Are you a scrambler. Are you over easy poaching? Poaching's great. I was Poaching's best of all worlds. I was originally an over hard person. Oof. Like that was <laughs> my me, that was my first instinct. Um, and then I just fry them. <laughs> and then I discovered that my girlfriend Evie really liked scrambled eggs. So okay. then we so then I switched to scrambled. Soft usually, scramble or dry scramble with cheese or without? Dry and without. Uh, it's still painful to hear, but I <laughs> so, I, so I'm generally a it's great non, source of protein. So. I'm generally a non-dairy person. Okay, I've been on the paleo diet for a long time. Um, my only cheat is uh, every Friday when we drink this alcohol. Um, okay. But so uh, I wash down my eggs with uh, kefir or kefir. I mean, okay. do people yeah, yeah, debate yeah. kefir. kefir. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So uh, that's a probiotic dairy drink. Yeah. So so I just mean to say that like I'm all about the dairy man. So. Yeah. So that's been like my notable exception when I when I have, you know, gotten really. And so I I haven't actually talked about this on the podcast before. I talk about it a lot in my personal life, but I don't talk about it on the pod. So for those of those who for those of you who don't know, I used to be really fat, like <laughs> like 60 pounds fatter than I am right now. Um, and my two best friends from college, they know who they are. I'm not going to dox them on the pod, uh, you know. It got me into shape, got me on the paleo diet, got me into fasting and all of that stuff. So I got um, really into it. That's the only reason why whatever slunk a raw egg uh, is, is because of them. Um, Were you doing 16-8 or what was your fasting uh, so I was pattern? Doing, I was doing at very least 24. Oh, wow. Day. Okay. So I lost I lost 64 pounds in a year. So you would go full 24 hours, then eat, and then do a full 24 hours again? Mm -hmm. So then, and then I would like reset on Sundays because, you know, the time that it actually takes you to eat, like it took me like 20 minutes. So then I get backed up 20 minutes each night. Sure. So my dining time would go from like five to like seven on Saturday. And yeah. then, you know, Sunday I would reset. So I do like 20 hours, take a little more time to eat, and then I would reset. And what was your calorie goals, you think? Like what were you going for? So I was intaking about 2,000. I was burning 1,000 a day. Okay. So wow. pretty pretty high yeah, uh, caloric that's, deficit. That's some, that's some strict fasting. Yeah. I used to – like guys, if you look at photos of me, like I look like a weeble wobble. Like it was just <laughs> – it was not good. Yeah. That was for um, the, you know, Arctic protection, right? Uh, yeah, just, exactly. You know, it kept warm. me warm in my many adventures uh, in the Icelandic Arctic. I would like to say for behalf of our lawyers that we do not endorse any of the diet advice that Nick is giving on the no, show. No, actually, we Please do, do not run a thousand do, calorie <laughs> deficit a day. We do completely endorse that. Yeah. It's actually a great idea yeah. and highly recommend you, it. You, sh you should get in shape. And that's actually something that, uh, you know, I, I want to talk about with Micah more next time. He had a piece called Time to Build, how I stopped, uh, how I learned to stop being a Gnostic and love the body. Uh, we don't have time to go into it super deep, but Micah, give your give your 60 second pitch on lifting and why everyone should do it. You are not just a soul in a meat puppet. 
you are a body and a soul and you should take care of your body just as much as you worry about your mind or the spiritual end to which you are headed. Mm -hmm. So uh, St. Paul said, physical exercise profiteth a little. And uh, yeah, I mean, it does profiteth a little. And you're, and Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt's father, uh, this is something everyone should have already known. I shouldn't have to say this necessarily, uh, but he, so TR was very asthmatic, very weak little boy. And at a certain point, but he was also very oh, so blisteringly, like <laughs> I'm not blistering, asthmatic. Bl blisteringly intelligent. Very bad. And, and, and so at a certain point, TR's father, who he hero worshiped said, you know, Theodore, uh, you have the mind, but not the body without the body, the mind cannot go as far as it should. Mm -hmm. You must build your body. You must Very make nice. your body. And Theodore resolved to do so and did. And it took the Badlands. And that's, I think, a big part of yeah. why he was as committed to the conservation of the American wilderness as he was, because that was where he discovered the fullness of himself and became the specimen that we all know and admire. Lift weight. Make sad head voice go away. <laughs> Save environment. <laughs> you know, love God. Th these are these are the lessons that Michael Metacroft has to give. Amen, brother. Absolutely. I can't wait to have you on again. We're, <laughs> we're going to dive into all of this yeah. for sure. Yeah, next time we have Mike on, we can talk about what bison nationalism is and, and why it matters. And we'll make Sarab's slong some eggs. Yeah. In we should course. actually on do that. camera. Yeah, on camera. I would like everyone oh. to see your disgust. Only if we get enough subscriptions. Uh, <laughs> thank you for being on the podcast, Michael. Where can people find the stuff that you write and your your ramblings and musings? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at at Micah Edocroft because my last name is Meadowcroft and there wasn't enough room for two M's, so there's just the one. So it's M I C A H E A D O W C R O F T. Thank you. Thank you. This week, when talking about things that we have on AmCanon, our content aggregator on AmericanMoment.org, we wanted to talk about something we briefly touched on in our episode with Micah, uh, which is the environment in which we live in. But the environment isn't just woods and forests, uh, mountains and rivers. It's also the cities we build and live in. And so uh, Jake Mercier, who's the producer for our podcast, uh, the CCO at American Moment, and, and obviously a dear friend of all of us, uh, he has a particular passion for questions of urbanism and architecture. And we wanted to specifically delve into the entire section we have devoted to that under the family and culture section on Anne Cannon today, uh, specifically a piece that we have put on there called Making Federal Architecture Great Again. Uh, this is especially newsy because uh, recently the Biden administration revoked a Trump era executive order that would have mandated that federal architecture, um, I, I don't know what the exact details was, but was, but but that the federal architecture would be great again, that it would uh, return to older styles of architecture instead of the brutalism that characterized so much federal architecture over the last 20 to 30 years. And so it's especially timely. I don't know, what what do you think about this architecture issue, Nick? Yeah, so first of all, you know, I want to give a shout out to Jake Mercier, like Sarab said, our CCO. Um, you know, as much as you guys love this podcast, it would not be anything without Jake. You know, he provides us with the show notes, um, helps us. We're like a wind up toy that he just like <laughs> puts in front of a camera. Like we just say whatever yeah, he tells us to. <laughs> that's true. Like Jake deserves the bulk of the credit here. Um, and he's also right, you know, on this architecture issue. And it's something that I know he's really passionate about. Um, so basically, you know, this administration order, you know, from the Trump administration, was explicitly focused on um, providing uh, classical architecture uh, from the federal government. So anytime a federal government building is created and designed, uh, it was supposed to follow kind of in the direction and in the design of other federal government buildings like the Capitol, um, you know, the, uh, the, the National Archives, uh, the Library of Congress here in D.C., um, it was supposed to be beautiful because, you know, a nation is nothing without the culture and 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 the beauty surrounding design um, 
that fills its imperial city. Nick, you've gotten into a fight with libertarians on Twitter before. Uh, as oh, as I'm we hoping you wouldn't bring this up. <laughs> as, as we often do. Um, I remember there was a specific tiff you got into as it relates to train stations in America versus yeah. in Russia. What what exactly was your point? Yeah. Here? So okay. So so I want to start this by saying like big disavow on communism and like socialism in general. But I have to say, you know, the Soviets had some good ideas about. God, somebody's going to clip that. Uh, <laughs> they, they had some good ideas about, uh, you know, infrastructure in their cities. So, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time studying, uh, you know, specifically architecture in Moscow and St. Petersburg about mass transportation. You know, they they sunk a lot of money, which, you know, by the way, they they stole from people who were, you know, humble farmers and blue collar workers to make their metro stations beautiful. So for those of you who have been to DC and have ha, and have been in our disgusting, brutalist metro, you know, a lot of people were in my replies when I tweeted this saying that like, brutalist architecture is beautiful. And I'm like, no, actually, I hate it. And like, it's <laughs> evil and it's an affront to God. But, <laughs> but basically my argument was that you know, the Russians built something beautiful that reflected their their culture, their heritage and, you know, uh, their history as a society. Like you can I, I highly encourage you don't use Google images because Google is evil. But DuckDuckGo, you know, images of the metro in Moscow or in St. Petersburg and you see these beautiful images, you know, paintings, carvings of the metro system in Moscow and St. Petersburg. They're they're gorgeous. And all that I want is a metro system in Washington, D.C. that's well-funded, that fully encapsulates, you know, American history and pride in the things that we build. Um, you know, there are going to be a lot of people in my replies after this podcast are going to be tweeting the link saying, you know, Nick, liking beautiful things and putting them in our metro is socialism. No, actually, it is a very good thing to be proud to be an American and to be proud of our history, and we should do more of it. So, you know, I, I had a lot of people, like a screenshot of my original tweet saying that we should make metro stations like this, made the um, Young Americans for Liberty Facebook page. They took a screenshot of my tweet and said, that's socialism. You know, for those of you that are listening, taking pride in your country and in the beauty of your country's history is not socialism. Yeah. It's a never, good thing. never let anyone tell you that. Um, and, and we have the arguments for it. If you want to understand how to argue this issue, go to Am Cannon, go to this piece, Making Federal Architecture Great Again. It was written by Colette Arredondo. Um, there's a lot of great content out there on how to understand this, how to argue this. If you need something to argue with your right-leaning or libertarian-leaning friends about why it does matter that our, our federal aesthetics are actually good, look, here's the thing. Only psychopaths would look at Washington, D.C. and be like, actually, we should tear down the Jefferson Memorial. Like, there's a reason for that, because once it's actually created, regular people appreciate it. They appreciate coming to their nation's capital and having these beautiful monuments to look at and appreciate. Um the metro that ordinary people use every day should not be suffocating and depressing. It should be it should be normal and beautiful. And it doesn't mean we have to go full, you know, ridiculous glass house Soviet style aesthetic. But it also doesn't mean that we should let it be dilapidated and failed. So there's a really good video on this. It's not frequently that I would recommend you watch a Vox video, but there's a really good one about the history of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, I forget exactly what it's called, so just head over to Vox's channel and take a look at it. But, but it's about we're gonna the, have to add it on M Cannon. <laughs> we are truly, and like this is one thing that we'll we'll agree with the progressive left on is like remembering our history, America's important history in you know leading the world and 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 kind of like leading world history, I guess, is important and it, and and it's valued and. You know, anytime that we create a monument, it should be something that's beautiful and, you know, correctly conveys our history. Love America. Love our federal architecture, provided Biden doesn't screw it up. Uh, and please make sure to like and subscribe and rate five stars this podcast. We've had a lot of fun doing Moment of Truth thus far. Please send in feedback to us 
don't do it by giving us a lower rating. Still do five stars. But please let us know how we can make this podcast more enjoying, uh, enjoyable for you to listen to. And uh, please make sure to go to AmericanMoment.org and interact with all of our different programming and what we have on offer. Thank you for all of your support. And thank you for listening. Thank you.